Are you curious about what yoga looks like off the mat or keen to hear how yogis all around the world live? This show will let you in on the secret that there's no such thing as a perfect yogi. Welcome to the Plant Powered Yoga Podcast. Please welcome your host, yoga teacher, coffee lover, vegan, and known as the Plant Powered Yogi, Jess Ivers. Hello, yogis, and welcome to another episode of the Plant Powered Yoga Podcast. Really excited to bring you today's episode and interview with Leonie Lockwood, who is a yoga teacher and yoga teacher trainer. So a yoga teacher teacher, I guess, uh, here in Melbourne. We caught up while I was still remote um, in New South Wales, so we caught up over Zoom, but it was really nice to connect with her again. Uh, again, one of the teachers that haven't been able to see in person for a little while, but looking forward to being able to join her again in person very, very soon. Today we chat about yin yoga. So Leonie specializes, I guess, in yin classes and is an amazing teacher and offer of yoga to people and doesn't ever make you feel like you're not good enough to be getting into a certain shape or doing something particular with your body. She's very well aware of making yoga quite accessible and making yoga something to be enjoyed for everyone. So we'll get into the chat. We talk a little bit about yin yoga and what it is and all about Leonie's learnings and journey along the way. So enjoy this chat with Leonie and I'll see you at the end. All right, welcoming Leonie Lockwood to the podcast today. Thank you for joining me, Leonie. How are you this morning? I'm very well. Thank you, Jess. Joining me from Melbourne in your beautiful home studio that looking at it, it looks like it's, a, you know, a dead set yoga studio set up somewhere in inner city Melbourne. Um, you've made it look <laughs> nice and uh, nice and professional and beautiful. Hiding the couch and the rest of the equipment. It's like the thing where you just like, oh, everything in frame and then you just, you know, push a couple of things out the side and I don't know if you, have you got any pets? I'm just waiting for like a cat or something to walk past in the background. No, I feel that that could add to the appeal. but, But no, I don't have any. Sometimes I have to like lock mine in the other room when I'm, if I'm doing any recordings, it's just like just yeah. in there and just shush, but then they end up scratching on the door anyway. So you're like, I'll just let them, you know, it's a cute. Let them in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we're all used to pets now. Yes. I think they've become our, our colleagues, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now Melbourne's obviously been in a bit of a rough time the last few months. You've adapted really well to, teaching online how's it all been going it's been interesting it's been a real (laughs) journey um lots of change and quite quickly so it's been very much a process of just putting yourself out there to see what happens and not expecting anything to be perfect and I'm sometimes hindered by that idea of wanting things to be perfect before I put them out and as many of us are and so it has it's been that you know it's that phrase jump and the net will appear (laughs) and so it's 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 been a lot like that so I've been doing a bit of that yeah Nice. nice And you are still, and then studios have finally just reopened yeah. in the last sort of couple of weeks and you've been being able to teach back in person again. You just quickly said to me before that you were teaching in a mask. So how was that experience? <laughs> uh, a little warm, but uh, because I teach in, uh, it's been okay. So I'm not huffing and puffing. I think it's made me realise in terms of communication that sometimes, you know, words get a little muffled behind a mask. So it's really caused me to slow down and uh, practice my allocution and be (laughs) a lot more precise (laughs) with what I'm saying. And that's that's helped. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, I don't know if you do any, uh, you know, vocal exercises before you teach to, you know, warm up your voice or anything, but I feel like it's that whole, you know, red leather, yellow leather. Yes, that's you have really to not do. A bad idea, actually. <laughs> yeah. While well, uh, well, you're adapting to this, yeah. And I think students have been um, loving coming back, but there's also almost like an 
an eerie silence as, as well. Like I feel like everyone's quite drawn inwards and of course yin is a very inward looking practice. So by the time they leave, it's bye and <laughs> out the door. <laughs> They've just gone into a little cocoon. Yeah, yeah, it's into a cocoon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's. I wonder if it's weird. I'm obviously not um, back in Melbourne at the moment, but I wonder how everyone's kind of been readapting to being back in social situations. And yeah, even in a in a yoga studio setting where it's something where, yeah, I guess you are more inward. You know, it's mm. not like a gym where you'd kind of just be bustling around. But has it even just gone a bit more? Everyone really keeping their space and. Yeah, and I think, you know, talking to friends, we're, we're kind of like, yeah, I don't really feel like socialising all that much. And my partner and I went out for dinner last night and we're like, yeah, yeah, we just kind of want to hang out, don't really want to talk to anybody else, just sit in the corner, eat our meal, go home. You know what, nothing wrong with that. I kind of, I'm, I love that it's turned a lot of those and you've probably seen this as well, that really element of like having to be busy and having to, you know, just be going out and being seen somewhere. It's just all of that is completely had to disappear. Yeah. And I, what I am liking is just more and more people sitting in parks and families in parks and families riding their bicycles together. And it's like, wow, this is awesome. Even through winter, I'd see like some mums take out a bunch of kids and, you know, put them on the picnic blanket in the park and do a little bit of schooling in the park, you know, really young kids. And I just thought, oh, that's so nice. Yeah, I think there'll be a few changes to come out of this that maybe aren't so bad. Yeah, look, you know, the traffic's back to normal in Melbourne, which is unfortunate (laughs) um, because it was perfect driving around when everything was locked down. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And but has it been nice to be able to I guess facilitate back in a space where you can see students and see people again? Yes, it has. It has. Sorry, I'll just turn off my phone. Okay. Um yes, it has been nice to to see people again and to and to connect up with students that you know, some students couldn't get into practicing online. Mm. So it was nice just to see those students back again. Um, Because some of them you were able to keep contact with via being online um, throughout the year, but others were like, no, it's not my thing, can't do it, just can't settle in my lounge room or wherever I'm practising. So Mm. for them it was lovely to be back in a studio and and see a person, see another face, have a conversation. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, I'm glad that things are are coming back to normal, so to speak. I know that word is not really... Rejuvenating. It's a bit of a restart in a way, isn't it? Yeah, it is, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But going back to the very start of your yoga journey, when did you first find yoga? When did you first start practicing? Where did it all start birthing for you? (laughs) Oh, wow. Well, probably when I was about seven or eight, my mum did yoga. And religiously, she went to class once a week for about 40 years. And in that time, she probably had like three teachers. So she stuck with her teachers for a long time. And so she used to do it at home. She learned, I think, at the Brendan Edwards gym in Forest Hill. And, and then she'd come home and she'd be doing Kriyas and Nowlies, like not so much a sauna practice. <laughs> more the cleansing things we we were the children who had to wash our noses out with neti when we got a cold like everybody else was taking you know cold and flu tablets we got the warm salt water up the nose so um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that if anyone that are listening and you know wants to try that with their kids at home maybe uh <laughs> yeah so and people were a bit like, oh, your mum's a bit of a freak. Uh, but it's probably very on trend now. She was just, she was just 40 she years ahead early. Of her time. <laughs> yeah. But we used to watch Swami Saravasti on TV because Swami, I guess she's like the first online yoga in a way. Mm. Um, so she used to have a program. So we used to do her program. And if I was home from school, I'd do it with mum. 
And so, you know, practicing our very wobbly headstands up against the cupboard and that sort of stuff. But then I, yeah, I really dropped out of it. And probably in my early 20s, I would go and practice. And we mainly just had Iyengar Studios in Melbourne. So practiced off and on. And I sort of, it was, it's always sort of been yoga or the gym for me. Mm -hmm. So I would sort of cycle in and out of that and in and out of aerobics and yoga. Um, doing mainly Hatha or Iyengar. And then in my mid thirties, I was pretty stressed and depressed and I would go to the yoga studio where my mum went in Middle Park on the way home from work. And I started to realise that the days that I went on the way home from work, I felt better. Mm. And so I started to go a little bit more and seek out other classes. And, yeah, and so committed far more than I had been because, you know, I'd dip in for a couple of years and then dip out again. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then it finally became a more regular practice. Yeah much more regular practice and so then I was so oh, what was that I think 42 I decided I was going to leave for India and do my teacher training in India and so spent a year in India then wow and, um yeah I did my teacher training it didn't take a year um <laughs> and uh yeah spent some time there and yeah. It, it really was lovely and it was funny as I moved around India I would just try and seek out teachers and, and practice with them whether the practice was good or bad it didn't really matter what type of practice it was just you know whatever village if someone said they taught yoga we'll just try it and see what it was like with them and you know so did all sorts of things um, so it made the experience and rather than thinking, oh, they're a crap teacher, I just had the mindset of I'll oh, try and take away one good thing from this person's class because they've spent that time and, and energy mm -hmm. um, with me yeah, um, and see if I can get one good thing out of their class. And I do try to keep that in mind now as I go and practice at other classes and to check myself before I criticised other teachers as to whether it's just me being in a bad mood. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a good point because I think there'll always be people and teachers like that. Yeah, there'll be people that you just don't vibe with and there'll be teachers yeah. like that. And it can, yeah. yeah, and even you could walk, I mean, most of the time, I mean, I know there's lots of times I've walked into a yoga class in a bad mood, hoping to feel better at the end. So yeah, <laughs> that, um, exactly. that could simply just be, yeah, the way you feel about that could just, just be a bad mood. And that's, yeah. Yeah. And, even if you, yourself. <laughs> yeah. and even if you don't vibe with the teacher, you can sort of say, well, actually I don't vibe with them, but it seems like a bunch of other people vibe with, with that person. And they've exactly. obviously got something to offer for, for yeah. that group of people. So yeah. Now, when you went to India to do your teacher training, what did you train in first? Uh, it's classical Hatha. Okay. So it was a flow of Hatha mm -hmm. and it went for two hours and it was the same sequence. And uh, it, was, it was unusual in that you held each pose for, I think it was around about nine breaths. So it was really long holds and you did that twice a day for two hours in, you know, 30 plus degree heat and humidity. <laughs> Not any nice air conditioned studio in, in, in no, Melbourne. There's no air the windows were open to let the breeze through. <laughs> yeah. But, and you know, it's very disciplined. Mm. You didn't answer the teacher back. You didn't really, you were very considered in how you questioned. Mm -hmm. um, and if for some reason you didn't like the practice, then you got up and walked out of the room. 
you know, often yoga evokes like a lot of strong emotions in, in people. So his philosophy was if you walk out three times, you don't come back. So, wow. yeah. So there was one guy who struggled with it and he, you know, struggled with the discipline. The, I think we started at 5.30 or 5 a.m. Mm. every day. And uh, there was one guy that walked out three times. <laughs> and you never saw him again. You didn't come back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm trying to think if I've ever, I don't think I've ever walked out of yoga class. No, I've only walked out of one class in my, in my life. I think I maybe left before when I think it was, which I, I realized sounds horrible, but then I did my teacher training and they're like, this will happen to you. People will see you if you're covering for someone and they'll walk out again. Yeah. Um, and I think I've done that once. Cause I just, I think I was in a day where I was like, I'm not in a great mood and and I had been to this person's class that well, they'd subbed a couple of times and I was like, I just don't, I don't love it. And it's not yeah. gonna, uh, the best thing for me to do, which it, it sucks. I feel like it's one of those things where you're like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm sorry. This comes at the expense of yeah. me leaving your class. But, um, but I think that's also, I think that's, you know, we yeah, are one of the things you learn when you become a teacher that yes. Yes. everyone will love you and people will leave and people will walk out and, um, yep. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I've had people leave like before the end of class in terms of that it's like, oh, I just, I don't have time to do Shavasana today. So I'm just going to go. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, just be very quiet, please, because everyone else wants to do that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Get up the back next time. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, if you are going to do that, just, yeah, don't come to the front of the class. Just yeah. get up the back and open the door and close it quietly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, wow. So then you, you've obviously specialized in yin over time. Yeah. Yeah. So you started out, I guess, yeah, doing it was a, a 200 hour training that you did. Uh, yeah. So my first training in Mysore was 250 hours. Okay. And then, um, I, whilst I was cruising around Southeast Asia that year. I also went to Thailand and ran into a woman who'd studied with Paul Grilly and she would just teach a couple of yin poses at the beginning of her flow class. And I was like, wow, that's really nice. I like that. What is that? And she was like, oh, it's this guy, Paul Grilly. And I'm going, oh yeah, I've heard of him. And uh, just like, you know, he trains down in, uh, what is it, Koh Samui. And I said, oh, I'll just go down there. And she goes, no, it's not like that. Like, you've got to get organized in advance and all that oh. sort of stuff. And I'd spent the whole year just living like, oh, I think I'll just pick up my backpack and go here tomorrow. <laughs> you know, so I'll just, it was kind of like, oh, it sounds like too much planning. <laughs> like, not for me, thanks. <laughs> no, it wasn't going to happen. So, um, yeah, so a couple of years later, I did plan and I went to Thailand and studied with Paul. And that was, um, and his wife, Susie, um, who's very much integral to, you know, the teachings that they do together. And uh, it just kind of blew my mind and answered so many questions about why my body couldn't get into lots of different yoga shapes, even though I'd been practicing for a long time. And some days practicing for hours on end in the warmth. So you think, well, the body's going to open because it's warm. I'm going to be able to get into these shapes. So just having that anatomy explained to me um, was quite eye-opening. Mm. So that's a really special part of what you offer as a teacher is that, yeah, it's, you, I've never felt like it's it's bad if I can't do something or you yeah the way that you open up mm. into that and from what you've learned obviously and and now I'm to share that that the anatomy part of yoga even if as students you know we don't necessarily you know want to come to a class and and learn all about yoga anatomy but it, yeah just that knowing that's like it's okay yeah that your body can't do this or, or can do this or whatever mm. it might be able to do yeah mm. Because, you know, yoga's been very strict um, in, in, in some, 
you know, some lineages of yoga are very strict mm. and very alignment, aesthetically alignment focused and, you know, kind of made to feel slightly lesser than uh, the good student who could do all the bendy, flexy kind of poses. And it was like, well, gee, I've been practicing a lot longer than that person, but I can't do that. <laughs> But yeah, someone you know, will just roll into the class. That, yeah. And the implication is that somehow that person's far more advanced, but it's just genetically, they were built differently from you. So it becomes a lot easier for them to just pop into shapes. Mm. Mm. And what you touched on then about you can be practicing yoga for years and years and years. And yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a, and I've seen teachers say that, that, you know, it's like, oh, it's all just practice and, you know, it, it is, it's a practice, sure. But mm, mm. it's like, oh, if you just keep practicing, you'll get there and, yes. uh, you know, it's like, well, one, your body might not be built that way and that's all right. And two, I'm sort of of the opinion that it's like, yeah, sure, you can practice these poses, but then like what happens at the end? Like, yeah. you know, it's like if, if that's your only goal, if yes. then, then what happens when you get there um and yeah I, I and see it. the next pose yeah. yeah so it's like you know well, what keeps happening after that but um yeah I think that's a really important thing and something I guess I'm really passionate about is that, that you know there's no such thing as a perfect yoga body or um yeah that even if yeah someone can do something from an alignment point of view that looks beautiful. Um, yeah, sure. It does. They all look lovely on the cover of the magazines, but, <laughs> um, I think it's, yeah, it's that, I don't know if it's a, a quote from someone, but you know, it's just like yoga is not about how it looks, but about how it feels. Um, yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think for a long time we all got sucked into the practice and all is coming quote, I think from Patavi Joyce, and, you know, you hear teachers say, well, you know, just keep practicing and your body will open. And, you know, I've been guilty of saying it as well. And um, I think students can then just not come back to class. And before I went to see Paul, the way in which I was teaching my flow classes was quite strict because that's how I'd been taught. Mm. And... Um, you know, sometimes I'd be teaching and I think, gee, I sound a bit like an army commander just barking orders. And it was like, that's really not who I am or how I want to teach. And, you know, you would have your regulars who would love it. People, some people really love being told what to do and how to do it. And some people struggle with the, and now I'm finding that some people really struggle with the idea of exploring their own body and uh, you handing the power back to them and saying, well, this is actually your body. Why don't you try and move it and see what happens? I'll guide you a little bit, but you now have to like to figure out what works for you or not. And they're a bit like, well, you know, I'm paying you to tell me what to do. So I learn art technique. <laughs> and it's like, well, you can learn art technique, but it might not suit your body. So let's try and see what works for you. Yeah, you're like, rather than pay me to, like, make you come out of this in pain or come yeah. out of this not feeling great, let's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> luckily, that's um, never happened from what I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, and look, I, th I think yoga's changing. I think um, Paul Grilly's book came out, I think, around about 2010, and I think this whole idea of functional anatomy has really blossomed in the yoga world. And so when I'm running yin trainings now, there's far less people over the five years that I've been teaching, there's far less people who were initially taught a very aesthetic alignment approach in their 200-hour training. Mm. Yeah. So probably should have asked you this before, but if anyone's listening, who's like, what is yin yoga? And, you know, cause I, there's a lot of people yeah. as well that when I say I'm a yoga teacher, I think, and even I was explaining to someone, I was like, oh, I'm doing my chair yoga teacher training. And they're like, what, what difference is that? Or like, what is that? Isn't yoga just yoga? And I was like, mm. well, you know, yes. Um, 
but if someone's never practiced yin yoga, so, you know, they might've gone to a class and I think some people go to classes and they don't even know what type of yoga they're practicing or that there's different types. Yes. Um, so what is, you know, if you're to sort of sum up, what is yin yoga? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a slow practice, which encourages opening of our connective tissue structures. So opening of the ligaments and the tendons. And it gives us time for contemplation and reflection. So typically characterized by longer holds, around about three to five minutes. And perhaps there may or may not be the use of props as well as adjunct supports to assist in opening the body. And whilst it's a slow practice, it's not a restorative practice. Mm. Yeah, there's a difference between those two. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing as well, I think when I've mentioned to people, I'm like, oh, yeah, yin yoga is where, yeah, you might hold the poses for a mm. little bit longer, a couple of minutes. They're like, oh, my God, what do you mean? Um, and it's like yeah. you're not holding warrior pose for yes. three to five minutes. You're usually yeah. quite low to the ground. Yes. Yeah, usually seated, usually lying, maybe kneeling. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so then some people freak out by that be like what do you mean i got to stand in tree pose for five minutes <laughs> yeah actually <laughs> which you know could be could be good practice <laughs> yeah whereas you know some other practices i think like Iyengar, they hold their poses for quite some time some of their mm. standing poses um yeah so you might find yourself in Iyengar class holding uh warrior pose for three minutes or so but not in your yin classes. Not in my yin classes. <laughs> we're disengaging muscular strength predominantly. <laughs> but what was it about yin that I guess has made you now want to specialize in it, so to speak, that, um, you know, you've become yeah. one of the, one of the greatest yin teachers in Melbourne and, and you have hours and hours of training and, and I guess that's what a lot of you, a lot of what you do teach now. Um, yeah. What was it that made you want to really delve into that? Uh, I hated yin. <laughs> you know, initially, I kind of hated it. Like I sort of loved it, but I hated it. I had a love hate thing with it. And um, but what I could see was that it really changed me as a person. That slowing down that reflection, that ability to sit with a bit of discomfort was really beneficial for me. And it changed, it changed my body in how the body opened and uh, made some of the poses in a more, uh, say, like a, a flow or some of the standing poses, more active dynamic styles of yoga, made some of them more accessible. So there was an element of opening the body and increase a bit of increasing of flexibility. Mm -hmm. But with the flexibility of the body came the flexibility of the mind as well. And that's what I've loved the most. So I think as a teacher, I've sort of moved from my army commander style to <laughs> something uh, far more chilled out which I like because it's an easier way for me to connect with people. And it also offered me a way of looking at people's bodies in, you know, flow classes and understanding why they weren't getting into particular shapes. And then that made me, uh, that enabled me to have that discussion then with that person after class about, well, how about we try this? And as I got more skilled at that over the years, you know, you can quickly start, read a body in a class and then make suggestions to the person. Yeah. Having to wrench them and hold them into poses. You know, I've been, you know, wrapped up into lotus pose, had my legs tied together to just kind of hold that in there, hold that. And you just, you know, you just keep coming. And it's like, yeah, but my knee, my knee. <laughs> I was like, just breathe, just breathe, you'll be right. I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that idea of just like breathing through 
breathing through any pain or breathing through the the hard part to, to yeah. get at the end. It's like, yeah, you kind of get and where it's going, but it's not really. Mm. And there's a, such a difference between discomfort that's tolerable for you and pain of yeah. sharp stabbing pains, which sometimes teachers have asked us to breathe through yeah. and told us to relax around those sharp stab stabbing pains and uh, they'll go away. And look, sometimes they may well go away, but sometimes we can also injure ourselves. Mm. And I've always, I've never wanted to injure anybody. I've always been terrified of that. Yeah. And uh, I don't think I've injured anyone in Yin. No, no, I'm sure you haven't. <laughs> I, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I think that's the thing. Like people yeah, do get yeah. injured in class um, and, you know, yin's not for everybody. But often if they are injured, you don't see them again. So they just don't come back. They vote with their feet. Yeah. You don't really yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, I'm sure you have lots of return um, Yes. And customers, so to speak, uh, in your classes. Um, now, you actually also offer yin training yourself yes. now. Um, yes. So have you been doing that this year with the COVID restrictions and have you been able to still keep doing that? Yes. We went online and uh, we did it live stream. So that, that was an event. And <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky enough to get a grant from the city of Melbourne um, right. <clears throat> where I live. So I was able to hire someone to put together part of the training online. So part of it's pre-recorded and online. Mm -hmm. And we did, we made up the rest of the hours live stream. So I'm going to keep pre uh, making some more pre-recordings and building up that material yeah. and offering a mix of live stream pre-recorded and hopefully in-person trainings. <laughs> next year yes hopefully when we can all be together again in the yeah. same room even if in we're a little bit distance but might even be able to hug you know all that sort of stuff oh can you imagine yeah. <laughs> it's been a great excuse though not to hug people that you don't really want to that's true i was thinking that actually in terms of uh and that's probably something else as well now that it's started to come back to class uh, in mm. physical class that, you know, physical touch in a practice that yes. a lot of that has now, I don't know, I kind of see that as a bit of a silver lining of, of all of this, of keeping your space from someone and, yeah, you know, a, a, an assist or an adjustment in a yin class can be really lovely um, mm. depending what shape it's in. And yeah, depending on your body, it can feel really nice if, if someone else is there to help you. But, um, you know, I guess it comes down to that aspect of consent as well and knowing if, you, if someone wants you to put your hands on their body. Um, yes. I kind of love that now it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a no-go zone of like not to be touching anyone. Um, yes, yeah. So I don't know if you, you probably didn't, I don't know, do any physical adjustments maybe in your classes recently, but um, is that something you've, I don't know, had to adapt as well as, as a teacher? and um, you know, you're being a toucher. Ah, there you go. Well, that's yeah. That's good. <laughs> and I, um, I mean, I'm a massage therapist as well, so I touch there, but I just don't touch in yin. Mm. Uh, well, very rarely, other than to say, you know, move this knee. And if they can't get when I say move your right knee, move your right knee, they don't understand where their right knee is. Sometimes you just have to like tap the knee and go, this one. This one. And sometimes that happens. You're like, yeah. left arm. Yeah. <laughs> the left left arm, yep. And then you're yeah. like, okay, <laughs> Yeah, look, my, my original teacher in India, he, I don't know what it's about being an Indian male, but he never touched us, rarely touched us. And... Uh, a lot of the classes I went to, <clears throat> none of the Indian teachers touched other than just a little tiny feather-like touch on a shoulder or a tip of a finger or, you know, just at the back of the head and an instruction to, you know, move your head back into the hands. Mm -hmm. But none of this kind of physical pulling around that um, some people do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of that happens now. So I'm kind of hoping that a lot of that will um 
but I think even before, I mean, before COVID hit, I think a lot of people were recognizing that and a lot of studios were bringing in consent cards and, um, yeah. So yeah. I think, yeah, a whole conversation had started before yeah. COVID around whether to touch or not to touch. And I think, you know, the best way to adjust somebody is to adjust with your voice and yep. with your cueing in, from my perspective. Mm. And very lastly, to do that physical touch. And I guess I'm very conscious in uh, any practice that, you know, I've got my own energy. And then when I lay my hands on somebody else, I'm imposing my energy on their energy. And that may be completely unwanted, not gel. And the mingling of the two energies form something else again. Mm. So kind of like to let people just sit in their own kind of energy bubble yeah and yeah. it is it's you know it's their their own space and their yeah. you know I guess if as teachers you know if, if you're always saying like hey this is your practice and your time and then we're kind of coming in being like no do this with your arm and like pressing down on their body then we're not yeah. really letting them experience their practice and their space either so you know yeah and we're not encouraging them to you know, to move around and explore. And I think that's been one of the really nice things about teaching online is that people are in their homes, they're fairly comfortable. A lot of people turn their screens off mm. and they're just doing their own thing. And hopefully they're not having a cup of tea and watching telly with, you know, everything on mute. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I feel like it gives them a, bit, a, a bigger sense of freedom. Yeah. Yeah, That's so true. Yeah. Mm. Well, could talk for a long, long time about all of this with you, but I will um, let you go as I know you have a class to teach uh, very soon. Where can people find you? You do teach around Melbourne and you are teaching um, yeah, a lot more online now. Yeah. So my website, leonilockwood.com.au. And you can also find me at Fifth Element Wellness in North Fitzroy in person. And yeah, you've got, I would say, I subscribe to your newsletter. So I get the, your little updates on when you are yeah, doing some teaching and when you've got yeah. new things happening. So I'll pop your website in the show notes as well. So people can find it there. But thank you so much for joining me today. It's been lovely chatting with you again. Likewise. Thank you, Leone, for jumping on the podcast and thank you for tuning in. I hope you got a lot out of that chat about yin yoga, about the past year and all the things in between. Before I go, I'd just like to leave you with a little tiny tidbit I found on Leone's website, which is leonilockwood.com.au, and it's that yoga fits you. You don't have to fit yoga. And I thought that was a perfect way to sum up that yoga for everyone looks so different Please head to Leonie's website for her online classes and to find out more about her and even her yin yoga teacher training. Next week's episode will be about how to be an ethical yogi with products you buy, the classes you attend, how do you translate all of the limbs of yoga into your life and, and really live as you would like. Looking forward to sharing that with you then. Until then, stay safe, keep practicing in your own way and I'll see you next week. This podcast was recorded on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and pay my respects to the lands, waters and skies upon which I live, work, play and practice. Thanks again for listening to the Plant Powered Yoga podcast. For more information, visit plantpoweredyoga.com or visit the show notes below. I'd love it if you could rate, review, or even share this podcast with a friend. Thanks so much for helping create a kinder world and see you next time.